any questions, write them in the chat. Prayer requests, write them in the chat. Uh, we want to be able to answer your questions and pray over your prayer requests at the end. So please do that. And if we don't get your question answered during the time where I do this uh, presentation, then we'll try to pick it up at the end. So who is our father? Let's look at, he's the father of the heavenly lights. Look at James, if you will. James chapter 1, 17. I got a bunch of scriptures. So if anybody wants to read, raise your hand and we'll get you in line to read. But we're going to start with James chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 17. Let me get to James 1, 17. All right. So Dorothy, okay, cool. Dorothy, can you read James 1 17? Let's unmute James, uh, Dorothy, please. Got it, or should I do Okay. Okay. I'm unmuted. I got it. Got you. Okay. Okay. James um, 1, verse 17, New King James Version. Every okay. good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Amen. So he not only gives every good thing that comes down. He is the father of light. I remember this guy telling a story of being on an airplane and God asked him what he did. He said he was his he was in the light business. Because <laughs> his father was the father of light. But look at that. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. You know, God will use people to bring good gifts in your life. And we should thank them for it you know, whatever blessings they are. But ultimately, we need to thank our Father because it's through His grace and His mercy that we get every good and perfect gift. Amen. So in Him, what? There is no darkness at all. He operates in light, not in darkness. Okay? All right. We are His elect. First Peter 1 and 1. Like I said, if you want to read, just put your hand up, hit that reaction button, and we're going to let you read. Otherwise, we can keep it moving. Rita. Rita, okay, go ahead. To God elect, exile scatters throughout the province of Pontus, Galatia, Galat what is this? Galatia. Galatia. Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's okay. One. So this is the salutation from Peter, the apostle who's writing this letter. But the point is, who is he writing to? God's elect. According to the foreknowledge, if you keep reading, there's to elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So when we talk about ourselves, we should recognize who we are. We're the elect, those that God has uh, foreknown. He, he foreknew that we would receive his son as savior. And we, um, you know, there's a lot of theological debate about whether people are the elect because God elected them regardless, or not regardless, prior to, so to speak. And that means that they didn't have a choice Versus he just knew that they would choose to be a child of God and they fall into the elect. The bottom line is we are the elect. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Because <laughs> we accepted Christ. If you have accepted Christ, you are among the elect of God. All right. Now, we are also chosen. Go ahead and keep reading this. Verse 2. The 
look like you cut your camera off. <laughs> Did I confuse you? Okay, let me read it. <laughs> oh, you didn't read it. Okay, there you go. The host will have to un unmute me. Oh, so. got you. Okay. <laughs> Who has been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifi sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace Amen. be. That's good. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That was, I cut you off just at the <laughs> end of it. My bad. Go ahead. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. <laughs> Amen. I receive the grace and the peace and abundance. Anybody else receive it? I take a whole hand for that, God. Thank you, Jesus. So he's telling us again that it was according to the foreknowledge of God. He knew in advance that we would be those who would receive Christ. Um, and in the sanctification of the spirit, interesting, you know, I do write a devotional saying, and today, um, Word of the day, I was talking about this whole process of sanctification. It's the process by which God takes the new believer, the, the Holy Spirit, once you accept Christ, comes to abide on the inside of you. And once that happens, the process of sanctification begins. As you meditate on the word, as you pray, as you sit under the word, as you walk in faith, the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of you, trying to help you reflect on the outside of you what already happened on the inside. I mean, no, there's a gap. When you first get saved, you say, I love God, but your life look all jacked up. Come on, tell the truth. You don't look nothing like God. But over time, through the process of sanctification, he begins to be formed in you. Uh, as Peter and um, Paul said, Christ be formed in you. So there, there should be a distinction between you this time three years ago and you today. This time, even last year, and you today. We all we're uh, growing, being developed into the image of God, being conformed into the image of God, being transformed. Really, is the appropriate word into the image of God. And so, when we are doing, when that's happening, it means the Holy Spirit is working in us, but we have a role we cooperate with, collaborate with the spirit by reading the word, by obeying, by uh, even Paul said, I beat my body and bring it under subjection, meaning that he doesn't just say, oh, well, I don't feel led. No, he brings his own flesh under subjection. He sees himself getting out of alignment. He got to die to Christ daily. That's what we all have to do. We have to make an, a, an attempt, a, an intense uh, intentional effort to obey the will of God. And that means dying to self and choosing God's will over your own. It also means sometimes you might struggle in a particular area. Some people cuss, some people lie, some people steal, some people uh, manipulate. We got all got some stuff that we, we bring into the kingdom and, and that gets stripped away the more, I, I liken it to an onion peel. You know, you take a layer at a time, you peel an onion back till you get to the core. When you keep standing in Christ, keep pressing, keep uh, keeping yourself available. The Holy Spirit is peeling away the fleshly things to get to the core. It's him living on the inside of you. And so people who meet you when you obey might not know, other than that silly grin you got on your face, <laughs> might not know <laughs> that you belong to Christ because you're still carnal. But 20 years later, there should be a difference. 30 years later, we can see some fruit. Uh, over time, the process of sanctification should bring you to a place where you look more like Christ. We won't finish. He won't finish, I should say. Not we, but he won't finish until the day of Christ Jesus, till Christ returns. How do we know that? Philippians 1, 6. He who has begun this good work in you you'll we'll see it through to completion. So don't get discouraged when you may fall short. Get yourself up, dust yourself off, repent, and ask God to help you to get it right. He's going to see it through to completion. It is he who works in you to willing to do of his good pleasure. Uh, Philippians, I believe that's 2.13 tells us that. So when we do what God asks us to do, what do you say? Abide in me, let my word abide in you, 
and you will bear much fruit. So you can't produce the fruit on your own. He said, without me, you can do nothing. But in me, you can bear much fruit. So as we allow that to abide in us and we abide in it, then we become more and more like Christ. Amen. So God knew it's going to happen. He's the source of all creation and human life. Let's look at Acts 24 to 29. Do we have somebody else that wants to read it? Not our turn to Acts 17. I believe we looked at this in one other context. Acts 17, 24. Yes. Okay. Stephanie? Oh, we got a bunch of people. Uh, okay, who was first? Is the lady on top. Is that Stephanie? Yes. Okay, so Stephanie, I'm going to give you all, y'all, so you can turn to it. You don't have to be like me flipping. So, Stephanie, you do X. 17, 24 to 29. Uh, who is that? Ronnie, take Romans 16, 26. Angie, take Revelations 4, 11. And then Beverly, we'll get you at the next slide. Okay, come on, um, Stephanie. Okay. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined that their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Amen. That is such a powerful uh, passage. We almost could park right here all night. But let's just unpack it a little bit. He says, God made the world and everything in it, right? He is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worship with man's hands. He worship, of course, in spirit and in truth. So what is he telling us? The God that we serve is the source of all creation, both he in heaven and on earth. And what, watch this. I don't want us to miss verse 26. He is made from one blood. Touch your neighbor. Touch yourself. One blood. Why is that important? People spend years trying to prove themselves better than others. Um, racism is etched out in the notion of superiority, when in fact we all come from one blood. We all come by the same blood. There's no distinction. We all who cut us, we gonna all be the same red blood. And watch this. He not only said we're made from one blood, but all of us dwell on the face of earth as he determined. And at the time, you weren't born in 1865 on purpose because that wasn't the time pre-appointed for you. And you weren't born in Russia or don't live in Russia right now, even if you were born in Russia, uh, that I know of anyway. We don't have anybody living in Russia. What's the point I'm making? God put you where you are when you uh, determine when you would be and when you would be in the context of civilization. So we are God. That's the bottom line. He created all this. And therefore, we not only should honor the fact that nobody's better than anybody else, but we should also honor the fact that each of us is created uniquely by him the way he wants us to be. Okay. Romans 16, 26. Come on, uh, Ron. It says, but now reveal 
but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God, to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. I'm sorry, I probably should have had you back up a little bit so we could see the context. Look at, um, let's see, go back. Go back to 24. 24. 24. Mm, my Bible doesn't have 24. Nope, it goes 23 to 25. Okay. Um, okay, let me. I got two Bibles. Let's see what this one says. This one doesn't either. Your Bible have a 24? You're in Romans chapter 16 and you don't have a 24. Yes, ma'am, I have a 24 in mine. Romans chapter six. Well, go, how about 25? You got a 25? I got a 25. <laughs> well, let's go to 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures according to the command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. Amen. So Paul, of course, is writing this epistle to the people and he's letting them know that the glory belongs to God who had concealed this truth uh, to a degree it wasn't widely known. So he revealed through Paul that he was not only here Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to the, to the, um, to the I, don't know, I know he called the lady a dog, but I don't know exactly how he said it. Bottom line, he said, I came to the children of Israel. It was first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, in other words. And so Paul got this revelation, which is partly why God allowed him to have that thorn in his flesh, because he said that man of revelation, he might have become arrogant, puffed up. Because, you know, that was a major revelation. So it is that he made known to all the nations. Uh, but what does it tell us? That it's God who revealed this mystery uh, that that uh, Paul is na now making known to all the nations. Uh, to the commandment of the everlasting God. In other words, his, his duty, his uh role as father, it is through the, that persona, for lack of a better word, that he said to Paul, this is what I want now to be made known, that everybody should be obedient, even the Gentiles, not just the Jews, um, should walk in obedience to the faith. So look at it further in verse 27, to God alone, wise be glory. So we know that that revelation didn't just come willy-nilly it came from the father okay revelation 4 11 go ahead and you are worthy O lord to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created amen so how does all things exist is by the will of God. How do you exist? How do I exist? How does anything that we see exist? It's all by the will of God. Amen. And he, of course, is worthy of the honor and power because he created everything. All right. Now, so let's look at some of the ways the Father operates. Look at Psalm, Beverly, Psalm 68 and 5. Read that for us, please, man. Beverly, Archie. Beverly? Okay, here you. I am. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, Psalm 68, 5. A father of the, I'm sorry, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Amen. So those who may not have a natural father or whose father has gone on to glory, 
or maybe was never in their life or was abused or whatever the case might be. God says, I'm your father, right? He's the father to the father. To those widows who are often taken advantage of, um, sometimes left desolate because, you know, maybe their family circumstances, their husband did not make provision uh, for them in retirement or maybe whatever the situation that they, uh, widows are generally set apart in scripture as those who should be defended, those should, who should be protected. We are charged to look out for orphans and widows. Um, that's why we in many ministries where they're focused that way. So here God is defending the widow. He She don't have a man, so to speak, or brother, whoever, to look out for her is the premise. This is God's role. He's the father of the fatherless, and he defends those who seemingly have a, a circumstance where they need these widows to tend to fall into that category. Over and over in scripture, you'll see that I'm talking about widows. His heart is toward those who need protection, those who maybe don't have the things the world has to offer that they desire or need to be able to be taken care of. And so, again, you see in New Testament how God challenges us to be those who are there for them. Because think about it, if we're his ambassadors, if God is concerned about the fatherless, what's the fatherless person? An orphan. If he's concerned about the orphan and he's concerned about the widow, then if we're his ambassadors, what are we going to be concerned about? The very same things. You know, you have to, as we talk about this process of becoming like Christ and becoming uh, in, at one with him, um, walking in his purpose and his will, look at what is valued by God. When you're reading your Bible, look at what God finds as important and it, as, it, as significant. You know, he looked out for those who were desolate. He looked out for those who didn't have. That's the heart of God. And I say that in past tense, thinking of when Christ himself was walking the earth. But he reflected God's, the Father's heart. He said, I only do what I see the Father do. So when we think about wanting to walk as a Christian, what we do is we emulate our Father. Just like he only did what he saw his father doing, we should only be doing what we see him doing. We should hold those things to be important. You may not have a lot of money, but you might be able to volunteer to feed the homeless. You might be able to volunteer to go and clean a widow's home for her. You know, it's, it doesn't always have to be money. Just checking in on a widow. How are you? Do you need anything? Can I go to the grocery store and pick up your groceries for you. I have a neighbor who um, has a widow in her church and she and her husband you know, I think it's every other week or so, I forget how frequently they do it, but they go regularly and they check on her, uh, a widow in their church family, make sure she got the food she needs from the grocery store, she needs an air run uh, even though she has adult children they don't seem to pay much attention to her um, so those are things that don't necessarily cost, I mean, the lady can buy her own food, so she's not even asking them to pay for it. And that's often the case with widows, um, I should say often, but it can be the case with widows that they don't need, per se, financial support. But what they need is help, is support, is the family, somebody to rally around them. I have another good friend who has a, a God, a mother in the Lord, who you know, she looks out for her. She goes with her to every doctor appointment, making sure she has what she needs, even though she has, um, I think, like a niece. But, you know, they really aren't there for her. So my friend has been in her family and made sure that she has what she needs. So I just encourage us, if you want to be like Christ, look at what God finds as important. If your agenda doesn't include the things that he finds important, then I'm going to challenge you to really determine whether you're following God or are you just slurping up to learn and to feel better and to be better in terms of you. And that's a good thing. You want to want to be your very best. But the next level is we go from babe to disciple to co-laborer. 
What does that look like? A co-laborer works alongside the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes or she becomes a person that he can rely on to be a part of the solution, be a part of advancing the kingdom. As a babe, we're still learning. But that shift happens quickly. Look at Peter and Paul. Jesus was only around three years on earth. So if you look at Peter, James, all those who walk with him, it wasn't a long time before you see them um, serving others because God is there, was with them. Um, Jesus was with them. He challenged them. You know, he sent them out to heal the sick, to, to um, raise the dead, so to speak. But he told them, you know, what you see me doing, that's what I expect you to do. You'll do even greater things, in fact, is what he said. But the bottom line is this. Quick your, let the Holy Spirit guide your heart and open your eyes and see, am I a part of God's hands and feet? Am I serving anywhere in the kingdom or am I only a beneficiary? Sometimes you can't be there. You can't do it. But guess what? You can sow into ministries that are doing the things of God. That's another way through which you become a part of the solution. You know, a lot of times we don't give a dollar to help move the kingdom forward. We sit back and assume that somebody else will do it. But the resources that you have, God has given you in part to be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. All right. What else do we know about God? God is love. Who is next to read? Uh, Teresa? Teresa. Okay. Okay. I got to find it first. <laughs> I'm one. sorry, John. And who's next after her? I don't have any more volunteers yet. Okay. They're coming. All right. John, first John. First, first John, John, all the way in the back. Yeah. Okay, so I uh, see Dorothy. So Dorothy, okay. you can do it through John three sixteen. You probably know that. No, how, how you do that? Wait, how I meet my thing? Um, you're good. Wait. Yeah, I can, you. You can yeah I can hear you. You can hear me now. Mm -hmm. Okay, John sixteen. First John, not John, but First John. Yeah, First John sixteen. By this. No, 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 no. You're First John four eight, all the way in the back. I'm in the back. First John. Okay, first John 4 8. See where it says 4 love. 8. Oh, 4 8, not 3 16. Yeah, I'll put that okay. up for the next person to be getting ready. Okay. Um, he who, not, who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Amen. Amen. You know, when, you, when we say we hate somebody, whew, I know that. God is not pleased because God is love. God loves everyone. How about you have to really check yourself and say, Father, help me in any area where I'm not like you. And some of us have to ask for help in this area of love because God is love. God is love. Drive that in your spirit. God is love. If I'm his child, what should I look like? Love. So if I'm not walking in love, then I have to challenge myself to look and say, Lord, help me. As as uh, David said, creating me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. I want to walk in love. I don't want to be one who doesn't look like you. Because he said, if you know me, or put it the other way, if you don't have any love, you can't possibly know me. If you hate your brother who you see every day, how can you love God who you've never seen? So we have to challenge ourselves to dig deeper than just knowing it in our mind. We want to know it in our heart when we are reading these scriptures. Hold yourself up and say, do I look like that? Am I allowing your will to penetrate me, pen penetrate my heart to such a place that I look like what I'm seeing? And if I don't, hey, let me turn down my plate. Let me pray. Let me ask God to help me to get over whatever's hindering me. I'm looking mm -hmm. like him. Okay. Next, is it Dorothy? Next? Yes. Okay. Come on, mm -hmm. John three sixteen. 
John 3, 16, New King James Version. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And we know this, but have you ever start to stop to think about this? We always focus on it. Whosoever believes. How did God, how did Jesus end up being here? God loved us that much. God the Father sent his only begotten son. He, we didn't get Jesus just because Jesus woke up. Of course, they're one. So I say that in a, in a you know, facetious sense. But when we think about the distinct roles of God the Father, God the Son, it was God the Father who sent his only begotten son that we might have eternal life. So it was of love that he was motivated because as we know from John, 1 John 4, 8, he is love. And he gave his son out of love. And who did he love? The whole world. He, did, he dispensed that love to the entire world. It's not the whole world who receives his son because we have the right to reject. He doesn't force that on us. But he offered like he cast a wide net, whosoever believes. That's an invitation to anybody who has a heart to receive his son, Jesus Christ, to put their faith, to believe on him. But I don't want us to miss that nugget. We read this scripture all the time. How many of us have really honestly stopped to think about the fact that it was God's love, the Father's love that sent salvation our way? All right. Of course, we know he loved his son. Who's next? Matthew 3, 17. And then Matthew 17, 5. Okay. Beverly? Beverly. So you're at Matthew 3, 17. Ruby is Matthew 17, 5. Janet, John 3, 35. Therese, John 5, 20. Okay. Let's roll, ladies. So I am 317. Yes, ma'am. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Of course, we know that's in the baptism of Jesus when John the Baptist was baptizing him and the heavens opened up and we know that the spirit landed on him like, a, like the form of a dove was said. I mean, he was a dove, but the point is God loves his son. So there's a relationship there that through him, he demonstrates his love for us. But it first started with the love that they had for one another. John 17, 5, go ahead. I mean, Matthew 17, 5, go ahead. Ruby? Um, he was yes, still speaking. Uh-huh, Matthew 17, 5. Yes, ma'am. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen Amen. to him. Amen. So he is on the mountain. We call it the Mount Transfiguration, where he is meeting with Moses and Elijah, and the disciples are watching. And, and God is affirming him now to them. And he's saying, obey his voice. Do what he tells you to do. So he's not merely just saying, this is my son, I love him. Now he's saying, I need you to recognize that he is me. He is representing the, the Godhead. Obey what he's telling you to do. So uh, it's kind of a double, double message there, if you will. All right, John 335, go ahead. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Amen. Well, that's self-explanatory. Because of his love for the son, he gave all things. And remember in Jesus' prayer in John 17, he said, I'm, I've protected those you've given me. So even we, those, well, at that time, of course, it was the Jewish disciples, farmers, as well as some uh, Gentiles eventually. But the point is, they were given to Jesus by the father. And he's saying, I've given him all things. Okay. Look at John 5, 20. 
For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Amen. So the Father, read that again. For the Father loves the Son and mm -hmm. shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Amen. So when we, again, see Jesus talking about how he only does what he sees his father doing, this in essence is telling us that the father has shown him the things that he does himself. So if I want to get you to follow me, for example, I'm going to demonstrate to you what I'm doing so you can follow my example. So Jesus was following the example of his father. He did what he saw his father doing. And he said he would show him greater works. And then it's interesting because I never caught that kind of thing. Now, how Jesus said in greater works we would do once he ascended back to the father. So there's a parallel there. All right. John uh, 10, 17, we're at, right? Yes. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Amen. So Jesus was sent with the notion that he was to lay down his life for the sheep. You know, when we think of him in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, as we just celebrated this, he was wrestling, pouring out sweat like drops of blood the level of stress upon him. You know, it, I heard a, a preacher recently, uh, Bishop T.D. Jason, in fact, talking about, he said, you know, a lot of times we focus on him having anguish because he would be um, separated from his father for a season. And we also can focus on the fact that he would take on the anguish of our sin. He had to take on the sins of the whole world. This is a sinless God being, because he was all man and all God. He was never, ever separated from his father by sin, because he never known sin. He never known the weight of sin. He never known the anguish of sin. So all that's going on. And um in the midst of all of that. But the bottom line is, he loved Jesus because he was willing to do it. And as Jesus hit that point of anguish, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass me by, but nevertheless, not my will. Because it was for this reason, he said, I'd come into the world. So in a moment of anguish, a moment of pain, a moment of sorrow, all that humanness was wrestling with the spirit of God, so to speak, as he was, as I said, all God. So the flesh part was wrestling. It's interesting because it's a good reflection of the dynamic of a believer's life. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. I want to do what you want me to do, God. But my flesh be trying to do something else. Help me, you know. Help me so that I can die to myself. And be able to say like Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. be done. And when we are in the spirit living for Christ, you're going to have some of those moments that you're going to hit a crisis. You want to do God's will, but your flesh is pulling you hard. And it doesn't even have to be an evil thing. Your flesh could just be wrestling because you love somebody a lot. And you want to be with them or you have some desire for something or some person or some whatever in your heart. You had a plan and God interrupted your program for his will to be done. You know, your flesh will fight. Your emotions will fight. You don't want to go down. Even though in the spirit, you know what's right. Your emotional and physical man may have a war literally going on within you to try to keep you tied to the carnal. When I say the carnal, I'm talking about the human nature 
versus connecting and obeying the spirit. It's a real battle. And the blessing to me of seeing Jesus wrestle with this is it gives us permission to wrestle with. You know, people say all kind of spiritual, not spiritual, religious things. Um, if you know God, you don't have to pray about nothing again. You know, you just pray and, and that's it. Well, I got to take you to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed three times. If it's possible, let this cup pass me by. Stop trying to be so super spiritual that you can't be real. God's son, who was both human and God, wrestled. So therefore, you're going to wrestle sometime. And it's okay. God still loves you. You never see in the scripture God saying, I'm angry with my son because he was wrestling. Never. He never stopped loving his son. And he never stops loving you. And so it should encourage you, I pray, to see that it's okay. Amen. All right. Where were we now? Who's next? Teresa. Okay. Okay. Um, so here we're talking about what does the father do? John 5, 23. Whoever's next, look at John 4, 23. Okay, go ahead. Uh. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm still trying to learn the Zoom thing. Okay. It's okay. 523. Yes. That all should honor the son just as you, they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Amen. Amen. So, so what does that tell us? First off, well, praise God, we need to honor the son, but it's premised on the fact that we honor the father. It was a father who sent his only begotten son. So if you despise his son, you in essence despise him. That's why he says, touch not my anointed, because I've put that person in place. I've blessed them, set them apart. When you despise them, you're despising the one that sent them is the essence of what he's saying. But it starts with you honor the father. If you honor the father, you're going to honor what he did. You're going to honor who he sent. You're going to honor his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So anytime you start rejecting, make sure you've heard from God. Now, I'm not saying you follow somebody because they got a title, but I'm saying if God is literally manifesting himself through a person's life and you know that's God's man or that's God's woman, sometimes you may not agree with them. But guess what? Don't disparage anybody. Don't tear somebody down. Go to God in prayer. One of the things I, I appreciate about a person who's following God, if their Holy Spirit lives in them, then when you pray, the same Spirit of God that's in you is going to speak to him or her. You don't have to cuss them out, talk about them like a dog. No. Go to Father and say, Lord, I, I want you to touch their heart and drive them towards you or what seems, I believe, is your will. Because sometimes, just because you don't understand what they're doing doesn't mean it's not God. Sometimes you just haven't grown up to that level yet. And you thinking they miss God altogether. And only to find out 10 years later when you see it, oh, man, they were right. <laughs> How many times have I heard somebody preach something? And I'm like, hmm. 10 years later, oh, man, that was great revelation. Because I hadn't gotten there yet. So be careful about how you dishonor others who have relationship with God. So we should honor the Father. That's the bottom line of what this text is telling. And we honor him by honoring his son. All right, John 4, 23. Is that reading next? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I can't. Rita, I'm trying to unmute you. So I'm going to go to uh, Ruby. Wait, wait. Not, I got to unmute it. Okay. Go ahead. And I, okay. Um, John 4 23. Mm -hmm. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship, worship him. Amen. This, of course, is when he's talking to a lady. She had four husbands, and now she's with somebody else, and that ain't her husband. And he says to her, you know, give me a drink of water. She's like, you Jews say we got to worship on this mountain. And he said, you're mistaken. It's not about where you're going to be worshiping. It's, it's how 
It is whether you're worshiping in spirit and in truth, not just giving her out with, you know, some of us know the religious moves. We know how to hold our hands up and look deep and pious and our hearts are far from God. God's desire is not that we merely go through the outward efforts to show we are worshiping, but that we have a true worship on the inside that's based in spirit, his spirit, and the truth of his word. We worship him for who he is and what he's done. We give him praise. So when we honor him in spirit and truth, it's more than just an outward uh, effort or outward profession. There's something going on on the inside. And of course, we know the word of God says that men look at the outward things, but God looks at the heart. And pardon me, it says she, he said, you have had five husbands. So I left one out and she had a man. So she really got six dudes going on. Bless God. She was me. So he was letting her see that. And, and we don't have time to go there, but let me just drop this little nugget. He went out of his way to go through there to talk to her. So God had ordained for her to hear that word. All right. So he's seeking such. What does that mean? God's desire, his yearning, and he's, he's looking to and fro, seeing who will really worship him in spirit and in truth. He's not just settling for any old thing. He's seeking. That's powerful. That notion that God, the almighty one, is seeking such who will worship him in spirit and in truth. He's looking for you. Amen. Tell your neighbor, God is looking for you. <laughs> All right, so look at John 15 and 16, uh, Ruby. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Amen. I love it, I love it, I love it. So... You know, we always say stuff like, well, when I found God, <laughs> and of course it's a joke because God wasn't lost, you were. You did not choose me, he says. I chose you. You didn't just stumble upon God. God ordained and set you up to hear the gospel. He had a divine plan for your life. He chose you to bring you out of darkness and to bring you Amen. into this light. Amen. And not only did he choose you, he appointed you. So this is the work of God the Father. He chose you. He appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Amen. So Amen. he says, and whatever you ask in the Father's, in my name, he may give you. Um Oh, you know what? I apologize because I kind of mixed that up a bit. Let me back up because I don't want to make it confusing for anybody. Let me back it up. This, I must go back to verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I've heard from my father. And I had to back up because I remembered as I'm reading this. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And this is the eve of his death. So he said, I, I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father. I've made known to you. You did not choose me. So this is the son speaking. And I chose you and appointed you that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father so that's the functionality that I wanted to point out got a little ahead of myself that you we ask the father in Jesus name for whatever it is that we want but notice that he didn't say you ask him Jesus said you ask my father mm -hmm. for whatever it is that you want and he will give it to you all right. So when we pray, who do we pray to? We pray to our Heavenly Father. We do uh, pray 
with the one exception, when you pray to receive Christ as our Savior, we say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. But in general, we're praying to the Father, and he's given us the permission, kind of like a, a, a stamp. You ever have a boss or somebody who had to give you his or her approval, and they stamped it with their seal or with their name tag, name stamp or whatever. Jesus is saying, when you go to be for the Father in my name, under my name, under my covering, under my authority, he's going to give you whatever it is that you're asking for. Pardon me, because I was getting myself off. All right. But this is Jesus speaking before he ascended back to the Father. Just before he's preparing to be crucified, he spent that time with the disciples when he had the Last Supper. All right? But the bottom line also, now that I'm remembering, in addition to that, he wants um, he wants us to bear fruit. Because he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Fruit that should remain. What kind of fruit remains? Eternal fruit. Souls, people that you went to Christ, not just fruit like you go and you know purchase up. But this is eternal fruit. So that's the desire of the Father. All right. Amen. Who's next? Do we have another another next? Oh, Stephanie got her hand up. Okay. Yep. There's Stephanie. So look, now we're talking about who are his sons and daughters. Look at John 1 and 12. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John 1 and 12. That's the one you want me to do. I'm sorry, say that again. You want me to do John 1 12? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Amen. So how do I become a son of God? Notice that. Son of the Father, daughter of the Father. I got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people say, oh, because I'm in creation, I'm God's child. In a generic sense, that is true. God created all of us. But in the spirit realm, when it comes to the family of God, if you will, he's talking about those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. So if you want to be a true child of God, you've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. All right. Now let's look at Galatians. Francis, go ahead. Galatians 4 and 6. Yes, Galatians 4 and 6. Just a minute. I looked away for a minute. That's okay. And it's the uh, NLT. Okay. Um, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Amen. So because we're his children, right? We're his sons. That's a generic son, not a male-female son. So that applies to us as women. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. But note it, we are his sons. We are his children. And therefore, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. All right? We are heirs. What does that mean? Look at Galatians 23. This is a kind of lengthy passage, so we um, probably have to break it up. Uh, Tories, let's see. Let me give you. You start from 23. And let's see. Go down to 30, please. Okay. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ 
that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. So I am an heir. You are an heir as a child of God. You are heir of the kingdom of God. That's good news. Somebody ought to say amen right there. And we are Abraham's seed. Remember when he was dealing with the people who did not honor him and receive him. He said, your father is the devil. You're not a child of Abraham because if you were Abraham's child, you would have believed me. Our, our sonship, if you daughtership, our roles as sons, how does it come about? We say because we've accepted Jesus as our Savior. We are now children of God. It's our faith that gets us into the kingdom. It's not our lineage by birth. See, the Jewish people were thinking, well, I'm Jewish and therefore I'm part of Abraham's family. But no, Jesus is saying, no, you, in this sense, this is Paul writing, but he's picking up where Jesus left off. Uh, you are not an heir unless you are born of the spirit. You are not an heir unless you have the Holy Spirit abiding in you. You don't get the Holy Spirit abiding in you until you accept Christ. We are justified by faith. Not by works, not by uh, natural birth, but by faith. We are a part of Abraham's seed and we are heirs with Christ. Amen. Who was next? Ruby. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pick up from verse, chapter one, verse, chapter four, pardon me, verse one. We'll go down to verse seven. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time spent by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time has fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Seven, so you are no longer a slave but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Amen. You know what an heir is, one who inherits when their parent dies, so to speak. We're heirs to the kingdom. So all of the benefits of the kingdom belong to us. All of the promises of God belong to us. We are a part of his family. We're part of his son and daughters. And therefore, we have a right, as as uh, the scripture told us back in John 1 and 12, a right to be called a children of God. So therefore, we have a right to the, the possessions of, and I say that in the spirit realm, obviously, but we have a right to the things that the kingdom offers. Uh, we are heirs to the kingdom. Our father is very wealthy. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Matter of fact, he owns the hills. But he also has many blessings in the spirit realm that he has promised us. Ooh, running out of time. I ain't paying attention how late it is. Okay, we're going to do this last verse, Ephesians 1 and 5. Go ahead, Linda. Okay, you take me off. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to good pleasures of his will. Keep going. No, that's good. So okay. 
What did he do? Read that again. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good will of the good pleasure of his will. Amen. So when Amen. you're adopted again, you're an heir, just like those who were born into a family. If you were adopted, that means you have all the rights and privileges of the child who's, who was born naturally into a family. So all the benefits and the blessings. Think about Abraham. You're his seed. What did they, What did God tell Abraham? He said, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Mm -hmm. We'll be blessed through you. So all of that is part of our, our, our lineage, so to speak. And of course, we look throughout the New Testament and we see the many blessings that God has promised us. And through the Old Testament is now we are grafted in, so to speak. So when you're reading the word of God, you should be looking to see, well, what exactly am I heir to? You know, what is God saying that I should be receiving? All spiritual blessings, uh, all the things that he has laid out in his word. So you should be embracing them in such a way that says, Ooh, look at what God has for me, as opposed to that, oh, that sounds so nice in the Bible. You should be looking at it as personally applicable to your life. Embrace these truths. They belong to you as well. I did want to mention the one thing, which is Abba. You see that over and over in scripture, Abba. Um, when you see that, that's a, a different kind of um, reference to the father. It's more like daddy. It's a more personal call. It's a more intimate call. It's not just father in a formal sense. Uh, it's the intimacy that says, that's my dad. That's my pop. So when you see that, we, by the spirit, are able to say, Abba. We now have this intimate, close relationship with the father. We need to cultivate it and get in the habit of talking to him when in prayer and reminding ourselves that he is daddy. He's our, our Abba. He's not just this, you know, figure out there in the sky somewhere. He loves you as a child. He loves you because you're his son. You're his daughter. And therefore, when you love your child, you will do what you got to do to help them when they get in, in, in some kind of mess. You do what you do to help them stay, keep from getting in a mess. That's the kind of love that God has, but think of all the resources he has at his disposal. So you might need somebody to help you. God can send somebody to help you. You may need some financial breakthrough. God can work it out to get you the financial breakthrough. You may need healing. God can heal your body. God has all the resources available that you need. And think of him as your daddy. So when you're approaching him, as your father, as your daddy, you approach him with a confidence that he cares about you and that he wants to bless you and he wants to heal you and he wants to um, move in your situation. You know, when you go to somebody like, you know, the president or, you know, your boss or hope or depending on the level of relationship, you know, just you going into the, the, the inspector general's office, you know what I mean? But when you got an intimate relationship with God the Father. Your prayer life is geared that way. You can pour your heart out and know that he wants to hear it and he wants to help you. So I just encourage you to see who you are and see who he is to you in your times of prayer. You're not just talking to something out there. The man upstairs, people say stuff like that. No, you're talking to daddy. So when you pray, pray with a heart that's toward David. Amen. I did not mean to go this long. Bless the Lord. I want to stop. It's just one of them things that gets a little juicy for me. <laughs> I am hoping that this has helped you. Praise God. Um, we're going to try to wrap up daddy. And then we're going to... Um, to Jesus, but we want to make sure before we go, a couple of things. First off, tell me where you are in your relationship with the Lord. 